Hi, my name is Brett from Blue Attitude. Today I'm going to talk about independent inspections. And really this session is applicable for those personnel who work in a part 145 maintenance organization, so the engineering uh, community, uh, and those people who actually maybe coordinate those uh, independent inspections from a part camo sort of function. Uh, so hopefully you see, get, get, get a feel for that. Uh, so what are we actually going to cover? So a bit of an overview quite briefly. I'm going to look at the regulatory requirements uh, for like part 145. Then I'm going to talk maybe a little bit more about the considerations. So I'll give you a bit of a feel for that, that what it actually is or when you should consider a, a independent inspection. Talk about the responsibilities. So that's applicable to both the part chemo. Talk about the part 145, so the maintenance organization. Uh, and again, the certifying engineer's responsibilities in doing that. I'll just cover some of the terminology, whatever that looks like, because uh, people have a different way of doing it. Uh, and then talk about what we call like a reinspection. So that's slightly different from an independent inspection, but we have a thing called a reinspection. So that's what we're going to cover today in this sort of session. Uh, likewise, if you like the, this training, this little mini session today, then give us some sort of th thumbs up or like the uh, video on YouTube. Also, if you have any comments or you think I've said something wrong or you disagree with it, then please just put in the comment box. I'll be more than happy to answer that sort of query or any other sort of comment. Likewise, if you do like it, then give us your comments and give us the feedback. So, let's start. So what is an in, now what are the regulatory requirements for an independent inspection? Well, for, well, just to clarify, an in, uh, sorry, an independent inspection requires two people. Okay, so they're normally classed as the first signature and the second signatory or the second signature. Now, there are different responsibilities for the and different uh, qualification requirements for the first signature when we compared to the second signatory requirements. So let's just look at the first signature first. So it talks about an independent inspection is an inspection first made by the authorized uh, person signing the maintenance release. So that's the person who's going to sign the certificate release to service of that sort of maintenance activity. And really they're going to accept full responsibility for the satisfactory completion of that work before being subsequently inspected by a second independent competent person who attests to the satisfactory completion of the work recorded and that no de de uh, deficiencies have been found. So just to clarify, that individual is going to complete the uh, maintenance activity, the task, is going to sign the certificate of research service uh, for that item or wherever that looks like, that maintenance activity. Uh, and then it's going to be verified by a competent person who's going to be the, the second sort of signature. So just to clarify, the second signature, that person is not issuing a maintenance release, yeah? And therefore does not, or is not required to hold certification privileges. Now really, it depends on the organization you see. Some organizations, if you want to release an aircraft back into service for an independent inspection, for example, then the second person may be a license holder for that specific aircraft sort of type. Or as I can indicate, and confirm for you that's not required that's not mandatory that's optional so every organization does it differently you can be deemed to be competent in doing an independent inspection and you may be not certified as a certifying engineer on that sort of type hopefully that makes sort of sense so that's the re that's the regulatory requirement so what are the considerations well broken down to maybe two little areas there's just a food for thought or to get you get your head around to think about what we're maybe you're going to consider as an independent inspection requirements. Firstly, we've got vital points. So they are like a considered to be a single misassembly of those items could actually lead to a catastrophic event, maybe some sort of fatalities or loss of or the aircraft loss or the whole loss itself. Next, we've got what we call control systems. So anything to do with that affects the flight path, uh, sorry, flight path, uh, attitude or propulsion force of the aircraft is changed. So we're looking at things that maybe include the flight, the engine, or propeller controls, uh, and, the, and the, anything that related to those sort of systems or associate with them. So examples would be the engine controls, the flying controls. Other considerations would be things like actually uh, life rafts, uh, slides, or any other sort of like roller current. They're just some examples. Yeah, just, just have to bear with me on that for this moment in time. 
Okay, so let's look at the responsibilities then. I've broken it onto three different areas. Uh, part camo, the part 145 maintenance organization, and the certifying personnel. So let's go back to the part camo then. Well, in the part camo, part of their responsibility is the development and the approval of the aircraft maintenance program. What you'll find here is that that aircraft maintenance program should be shared with and provided access to the those personnel in the part 145. That's really important. Uh, because also the reason for that is, is that, that the PAR camo needs to ensure that those certifying engineers really are aware of and understand how they've identified what they consider to be a independent or the requirements for an independent inspection. What I can tell you is from like an auditing sort of function that is overlooked and people don't actually uh, confirm that from both from a PAR camo function or a PAR 145. It's definitely a gap and a bit of a risk within the uh, av aviation industry at this moment in time. If you look at the part 145 guys now, or the organization itself, as an organization, they would have identified within their MOE, which is the maintenance organization expedition, they would have identified what they consider to be considered as a uh, independent inspection requirements. And again, from an auditing aspect, you'd be surprised how many people don't realize or recognize the requirements of what the organization says as a independent inspection requirement. And next, finally, the, the certifying personnel, well, they should be aware of their responsibilities as per their authorization, and they should really understand what the MOE requirements are for a uh, uh, independent inspection, and also understand what the part camo requirements are, that's David, how they've identified within the AMP the uh, independent inspection requirements. Again, something that's overlooked uh, and sometimes forgotten about. So who can raise an independent inspection? Well, really, just to clarify that, anybody can. Yes, the part camo would, would obviously identify that's an independent inspection. Yes, the part 145s would say that's what they consider. And the, the certifying engineer can also raise a independent inspection if they believe that item requires that to be carried out. So different responsibilities for different sort of parts of the uh, requirements. Okay, so let's now look at the terminology. What you'll find is, there is some, you will find some people actually use, or write down in an inspection, and I will say they use the word narrative to say, as required. If people do use that, then that's incorrect. It needs to be specific. So what I've identified, there are five terms that should actually really fill the thought on to clarify why we're doing the independent inspection or why you're going to raise the requirement to do an independent inspection. I'm rather going to check it for the correct fitment, I'm going to check it for the correct assembly, correct locking, correct function, i.e. the operation, does it you know go up and down as, as, it, as, it, as in it comes with the maintenance manual data, or the correct sense. So let's think about flying controls, for example. Do they move in the correct sense? Uh, when we're talking about ailerons, the rudder, do the flaps move up, move down, and so on. You can also raise a independent inspection, for example, additional inspections. So when we think about covers, blanks, panels being refitted uh, that have maybe been removed. So again, you can check for things out whether they've been removed or reinserted. Again, that's like another requirement for an independent inspection. So the terminology is quite key. Correct fitments, assembly, locking, function, sense, you may actually raise another requirement for additional inspections, but it must be specific. Do not generalize the terms. Just continue with the terminology. You know, we need to think about as well that, and it's important when we talk about control systems that, that actually are duplicated, and then really they must be treated as individual and separate systems. From like, for example, when we've been auditing and when we do, you know, even from my own experience as a aircraft maintenance engineer, what you'll find is some people actually group things together. So for example, and I've seen it documented where people have actually carried out an independent inspection as required on the engine. And as you can understand, they can appreciate, there are numerous attachment points, control cables, all the sort of things that you may want to check on the engine that require their own individual sign off for that each individual item. So what I'm trying to say to you is, you must not group things together. So if it's a control cable run from A to D, it's A to B, from B to C, C to D. 
there's numerous sort of steps in that independent inspection system. So they must be treated as individual items, not collectively. And again, when we think about the certification, the engineer or the person who's actually like the, yes, you got the initial sort of like the first signatory is taken considered for the whole sort of maintenance activity and appreciation of what that is. Likewise, the second person must need to understand what the maintenance activity has been involved and appreciate that as well. So they have like an overview of what's being done to ensure that everything's been covered. And the final thing really, you know, it must be signed for as soon as possible. Don't delay it, sign for it once it's been completed. There's been numerous uh, industry sort of events that have happened where people get distracted when they're doing that inspection. So likewise, do not get distracted when you're doing an independent inspection. And what, again, every organization does differently. And like a top 10 tip, if you are doing like an independent inspection, then maybe tell people you're doing it not to be distracted. Some people wear a high vis vest, a different sort of color to say that they're doing an independent inspection, not to be disturbed and so on. It is important uh, to not get distracted when you're doing an independent. Because remember we're talking about vital systems, vital points or control systems that if, they, if the event they failed, we're talking the loss of an aircraft. So it's important we need to get it right the first time. Likewise, if you find it a discrepancy and you're the second person doing the inspection, then you need to basically raise a new entry to indicate that that independent inspection was unsuccessful and it needs to be closed out again and relooked and reworked on if that's required. Okay, and then finally, what is a reinspection? Well, a reinspection can only take place in a line maintenance environment. So what that means is it's like this. An item will require an independent inspection. And let's say, for example, we have like an aircraft inbound to the line maintenance facility. What will happen is, let's say, for example, we're going to replace a flap uh, or control service on the aircraft. Then it's an unforeseen circumstances. So therefore, an income and defect, uh, we need to carry out an independent inspection. So we replace the flap. Uh, and the way we would do this is that the, obviously it's just myself, I'm the certified engineer, I'm gonna uh, do the inspection, do what I need to do, release the, uh, what I've just done, and it comes with the approved maintenance data. And then in accordance with our current procedures, for line maintenance only, I'm going to re-inspect what I've just done, uh, and there'll be a, maybe a time differentiation between that. And I'll record the time difference when I did the first inspection as the CRS holder, and then as the second person, I'll record the time I did that. The important thing to remember it cannot be used in a planned maintenance input. So let's say we're in a maintenance, a line maintenance environment now, uh, and I'm working, you know, I've got a scope of work. It's been issued for me to by the part camo departments. As a 145, we're gonna do this work in a line maintenance environment. I cannot do what we call a re-inspection. It only can be used in unforeseen circumstances when the aircraft arrives and there's a defect that we need to address that requires an independent inspection. You cannot use or apply the reinspection sort of theory in a base maintenance environment. That's not permitted. It's only for light maintenance environments when there's un like a unforeseen an event that comes in that requires an independent inspection. And in that back category, it's what we classify as a reinspection. That's important. We've come to the end now of the training course, uh, or this little session, I should say, to talk about independent inspections. And we've covered quite a lot of narrative or detail uh, in, in a short sort of time. If you have any sort of questions, then you can always give us a contact us on the telephone number that you can see on the screen. You can email us at sales at blue-altitude.com, or you can go to our contact us on the website, hit that page, fill in the narrative, fill it all in, send it to ourselves, and then one of the team will get back to you to answer your sort of query. Or you can, on obviously this post is on YouTube. If you like it, then like the uh, little video itself, or, and, or I should say, or an and, leave a comment. If you need any sort of questions, then put your comments on the, on the narrative, uh, and again, we'll, we'll be more than happy to answer it. That's it. Uh, thanks for your time today. Hopefully it's been of some sort of benefit, and I've clarified a few things uh, in a short space of time. Have a good day. Take care. Bye-bye.